So in this lecture, in this uh, short video lecture, I'm going to talk about contracts. And uh, contracts, um, I'm going to start with assertions, pre and post conditions. Now what's an assertion? An assertion is a statement that's either true or false. So it's a Boolean expression that we are trying to assert. Like for example, you can say, I want to try to assert that x is greater than or equal to zero right here. So we may require that x to be greater than or equal to zero and as an assertion here. A precondition uh, for a function, for example, we may say that we require at this point the y to be greater than or equal to zero. So we make sure that the precondition is met so that function will not have undesirable outcomes. The post condition means that we ensure that some condition has come true at the end of this function. So we, there are three things that are important, assertions, preconditions, and postconditions. Now loops are really important things in programming. We write a loop to iterate over a set of statements again and again and again. Now one of the things we need to assure that the loop will terminate and also the loop will produce the desired output. These two things are really, really important. Now, so in order to get there, we will start with a concept called a loop invariant. So what is a loop invariant? A loop invariant is a Boolean statement that is true at the start of the loop, that's true one time in the beginning, and then the, at the end of each iteration. This means that the loop invariant must be true immediately after you exit the loop. So why do we study loop invariants? We study loop invariants to probe properties of loops and that will allow us to prove the partial correctness of loops and what the loops will produce, what the outcome is. And here's an example. So let's take this simple uh, loop as an example. Let's try to define some Boolean statements that may or may not be true uh, as a loop invariant. So we can take a very trivial one, say it's one equals one, which is a loop invariant because it never changes inside the loop. So that's great, but it is kind of useless. If you take some statement like i equals i, which is also true inside the loop because i is part of the loop, but again, it's a trivial statement. Therefore, although it is a loop invariant, but they are not really useful. If you take a statement like i is strictly less than n, is that a loop invariant? Let's try to see that. We know that when we start i is equal to zero, so if we assume that n is strictly greater than zero to begin with, this condition is true. What about after one iteration? So i prime is i plus one. Can we prove that i plus one is less than, strictly less than n? The answer is no. Therefore, this is not a loop invariant. What if I say i is less than or equal to n? Well, I should be able to prove this now because in the beginning i is zero, if I assume n is greater than or equal to zero as a precondition, then I know this statement to be true. And the i prime, which is equal to i plus one, is now less than or equal to n since i is strictly less than n. So we did find a loop invariant called i less than or equal to n. Now if I take the loop invariant, i is less than or equal to n, which I know is true here outside of the loop, and also the loop exit, exit condition which says i is greater than or equal to n, I can conclude that at the end of this loop, i must be equal to n. Now, let's, how do we find a loop invariant? Now, this is a process that may take a while. So let's think about this piece of code. Now, we do not, we do not know what this does. It's some, some piece of code that is doing something. Now, obviously we can use something like coin to figure out given x, we can find maybe we can do a few explorations. What is g of 0? What is g of 1? What is g of 2? And so on. We can do that, but that doesn't give us a loop invariant. That may give us a hint about what this function produces. So to find the loop invariant, we have to come up with a statement, a Boolean statement, that get involved, get involved i, j, and k perhaps, to come up with a statement that's that we can prove. So there are four things in this piece of code, x, i, j, and k. Now, we do know that x is a loop invariant because x never changes inside the loop. Let's start with x to be zero. 
and we do know that initially i j and k are all zeros now when you go into the loop the j changes to j plus k plus 3i plus 1 since i j k and i are 0 the j will become 1 in the first iteration the k will become k plus 6i plus 3 so since k and i are 0 and to begin with k would become 3 and i would be incremented to 1 now in the second iteration of the loop the j becomes j plus k so it will take 1 plus 3 that would be 4 3 times i that's 7 plus 1 so j would become 8 and k would become k plus 6i 3 plus 6i that's 9 plus 3 k would become 12 and the i would become 2 at this point the j is greater than x which is x equals 4 therefore the loop will exit now let's see that we can draw some conclusion out of this very limited set of data now I'm going to conclude the following I'm going to say there's a relation between i and j it seems to me that if you take i and cube it it is equal to j perhaps if I do a few more with the larger x I may be able to find this to be true or not and also there seems to be a relation between i and k in fact that relation seems to be that k is equal to 3 times i squared again if I have more things to show this it would be better but I can just uh, show that the it seems like k equals 3i squared so let's say that how do we prove this so we have two things that I'm claiming I'm claiming that i cube is equal to j and k is equal to 3i squared now if it's a loop invariant then I must prove that this is true in the beginning obviously it is true because i and j and k are all three are zeros so beginning one is okay but what about after one iteration what about i prime cube now the i prime is the same as i plus one because i changes to by one and i plus one cube is equal to i cube plus three i squared plus three i plus one and let's look at j prime now the j prime is equal to uh, j plus k plus 3i plus 1 so the question we have is can we show that the i prime cube is equal to j prime uh, well at least I have two terms here 3i equals 3i and then 1 equals 1 but I'm not really sure then I also know this I know that this is true but so if I can prove that k equals 3i squared I will be able to prove this so let's try to prove k equals 3i squared 3i squared as a loop invariant so to prove that I need to prove that k prime is equal to 3 times i prime squared and what is k prime k prime is equal to k plus 6i plus 3 and i prime is i plus 1 so if I do this and I'll get 3i squared plus uh, 6i plus 3 on this side since k equals 3i squared I will get the same thing here so hence I can prove that therefore that I prove that this is a loop invariant now both of these are loop invariants so I can confirm that they are loop invariants indeed now so the other problem that we have is proving the loop termination now in this case the code if you look at the code that the j eventually because j is an increasing function must eventually exceed the x and since j is always increasing at least by 1 k is always increasing at least by 3 and i is always increasing at least by 1 so we do know that j is going to be sometime going to go over x so in order to prove the loop termination we say that since uh, j increases okay and the j is going to be at some point greater than or equal to x and the loop will terminate at that point so how do we get the post condition from the loop invariant now loop invariant post condition now we have two loop invariances in this case i cube equals j 
and k equals 3i squared. Now it seems to me that the loop condition was that while the j is less than x. So it seems to me that since j is equal to i cube, we are testing to find the i whose cube is less than x. And so, for example, when it's 4, 1 was the i that we got. When it's uh, 2, perhaps uh, if x was uh, something like 9, we might be able to get that uh, the uh, 2 cube, which is 8, is less than 9. So this is a little bit of, uh, we'll leave that discussion for class and uh, we will end this uh, video lecture now.